hi, as he said, my name is Maddie Stone, and this is Chamois, and what I'm claiming to be Android's most impactful botnet of 2018. So basically all this says is, currently I'm focused on Android apps, but I basically like to break and understand how anything from chips to applications works. So what is Chamois? It's a sophisticated Android botnet that backdoors Android applications in order to do ad fraud, SMS fraud, and installation fraud. Uh, but let's level set first and just make sure we all understand the Android application ecosystem. So there's a lot of different ways that users can get Android apps on their devices. So in North America and Western Europe, that tends to be through the Google Play Store. But outside of those areas, users generally sideload applications, which can be, you know, downloading from websites, peer-to-peer, third-party app stores. And then, of course, every device comes with some applications pre-installed. And each set of those applications is going to differ based on the device you have. There's also a couple of different acronyms that I'm going to be using throughout this presentation. The first, PHA, or Potentially Harmful Application, that's basically our Google Android term for malware, or something that could be harmful to a user. And thus, when something meets the bar of PHA, that's when we use Google Play Protect, or GPP, the built-in security um, functionality and that's in all certified Android devices to protect users. And lastly, sometimes I call Android apps APKs, because that is the file format that Android apps are in. But let's get an overview of what is Chamois. So first off, it's PHA category that we use in um, Google Play Protect. And what we classify it as is a backdoor. And the reasoning is because it can be remotely commanded and controlled to do different malicious behaviors. And those malicious behaviors are a couple of different things, but can generally be categorized into three different types of fraud. The first is premium SMS fraud. So it's not as common, again, in North America or Western Europe, but in a lot of areas around the globe, people pay for services and items by sending a text message to a short code, and then it immediately charges their bill. In the Western world, this might be, uh, it's the same as when they're like, text 5555, and you will donate $5 to hurricane relief. So it becomes fraud when the user doesn't know this is happening or consent to it. But because it's a backdoor, although these are the three types of payloads we've generally seen from Chamois, they could at any time develop a new type of malicious payload and distribute it to every device that is running Chamois. But taking a step back, the way that it was distributed is it's an SDK that third-party app developers unknowingly include in their applications, thinking that it's providing some feature or advertising library or monetization SDK when it's actually a backdoor for a botnet. So we're going to cover four distinct variants. Um, some of those boundaries can be a little fuzzy. Sometimes they can be counted as more of them. But in general, based on the functionality coming from the actor behind Chamois, I classify them as four. And each one of those contains four to six different stages. But let's set the stage for how did Chamois get here, what's the background, and things like that. So as I said, Chamois was first detected in mid-2016. That was variant one, and at that time, Sean was, was primi primarily distributed through Google Play. Then, in November 2016, a few months later, we saw variant two. The distinction between variant one and variant two was variant one only did ad fraud. And then variant two added this new premium SMS fraud payload to the botnet. Variant two also was on Google Play. Last, then, in March 2017, Google posted a blog post saying, hey, we eradicated Chamois from Google Play. But here I am standing in front of you in April 2019, two years later. So what's happened since then? So the claim that we eradicated um, Chamois from Google Play still stands. Come March 2017, Chamois went quiet. There was no C2 traffic, no testing infrastructure traffic, no new samples or anything. So, you know, you get comfortable, you keep looking. But come November 2017, new samples started popping up. I and a team member each independently identified Chamois had come back in January 2018. 
So I was working, one of my jobs is that my team and I, we review all of our OEM's um, images prior to launch for security issues within them. And an app had been surfaced for human review. It was super obfuscated, had no icon, was named Sales Tracker, and just had nothing that looked obvious in it. So I started reversing. At the same time, one of my coworkers from the anti-abuse research team had started noticing really weird ad traffic coming in. Clearly suspicious, but not identified as anything else. We both continued hunting and were able to say, whoa, Chamois is back, and it's way more sophisticated than before. That was variant three. So variant three was much more sophisticated, added two more stages to the original Chamois and V2, um, but still tended to keep to the same types of payloads, just more sophisticated. In summer 2018, we had to be really honest and take a look at it and realize that us working independently was not sufficient to tame Chamois. It had come back as a smart, sophisticated, deliberate, and very effective threat. So we joined together, created a multi-team investigation. At the same time, Variant 4 popped up, which removed much of the signals that we were signaturing. But by December 2018, we were able to put it in a monitoring and maintenance mode, saying that we have this controlled, and four months later, I can still say it's controlled. But me claiming that this is the most impactful botnet in Android in 2018 is a pretty bold claim. So why did I say that? One, technical complexity, which we'll get into all those fun details. Two, and one that's really interesting is they used a lot of different multiple, or they used a lot of different distribution techniques. So one of the ways that we staunch flow of malware into different ecosystems is stem the supply. Just track it back to how is it getting there, how is it spreading. Chamois was smart, and they distributed so that if you stemmed one of the supplies, they had a lot of backups and a lot of different ways to spread. So beyond that, this is an engineering product that a team of engineers are building. They have rapid and mature test, um, release processes with testing infrastructures, and the actor behind them has funding, has engineers on staff, and a very sophisticated infrastructure to deploy their testing and releases. And lastly, they're using a lot of different types of ad fraud techniques, and they're varying it um, across the ecosystem so that if one gets burned, it does not take down the whole monetization of the botnet. So let's get into the fun stuff. This is the overview. I've mentioned four different types of variants. We're going to focus on the current ones, variant three and variant four, because they're the most technically sophisticated and the most current. But let's take a step back to understand this evolution. So this is the sort of flow of the different stages from variants one and two. Back in 2016, they were already this sophisticated. And if you think back to what Android security looked like in 2016, this is not you know, looking for the low-hanging fruit. They combined APKs unpacked from a custom encryption in archive format, different jars, as well as using native code um, in order to do some of their behaviors. And when they, after that hiatus, they came back for variants three and four and moved from a four-stage um, botnet to a six-stage effort. So if we talk about this in terms of anti-malware, we generally all see as AV companies, as well as ourselves, the APK is that first thing you see and what most signaturing type of detections will use. However, in Chamois, stage one has almost no functionality in it. It just unpacks from itself stage two. And so every stage after stage one can sort of be grouped into these three categories. The Chamois loader, which includes super sophisticated anti-analysis, obfuscation techniques. Then the Chamois framework, which that's sort of the backdoor area of this. It's able to be self-updatable, um, so that's where stage four comes in. Of It will call home to the botnet's C2 infrastructure for the framework and say, hey, does our framework need a update? If so, stage five is updated. Otherwise, it will use the one that it can un unpack from a special archive format um, that it has. Stage five is then responsible for the different payloads. We can see here that we break the payloads in stages six up to 6A, 6B, and 6C. 
6B is what we consider the malicious payload. There are more than 15 different malicious payloads that we know of thus far, and they're still being developed. Stages 6A and stages 6C exist to support 6B in doing malicious behavior. So they know that, you know, while we may be able to do the malicious behavior in the jar, we may need native code to support us to be able to do that. So for example, 6A will do JNI web view modification to support some of their ad fraud behaviors. So I talked a few things about the custom archive format. That's where most stages three plus come from and are unpacked from by each stage previously. So the custom archive format is the most stable aspect of Chamois all the way from variant one down to variant four. <laughs> um, and it's sort of similar to a zip if everything about a zip was changed. So they created this custom file format that can have, sort of like Inception, more of the custom archive formats included. But one of the really, quite frankly, smart engineering moves they made was that if you have a copy of the custom archive format, you cannot unpack it unless you also have the APK that it belonged to. And you also cannot unpack or figure out what stages three plus were if you, don't, if you have the APK and you don't have the custom archive format. So by doing this, and that each different sample of Chamois was independently generated, it made it that much harder for um, detection and defenders to understand what's in it. But one of the toughest aspects of Chamois is this really sophisticated anti-detection techniques. And they do some sort of debugging or obfuscation at every single stage of, so all six stages, in variants three and four. So stages one and two, every sample's strings, class names, file names, everything is randomized and different for, different for each sample. So there's not really much you can do in terms of sim signaturing there, because it's not like they used the same lengths of strings for the class names and package names. They changed it at each time. And then stage three's purpose is to do anti-debugging. If we go back to that flow chart I showed you, um, stage three was the last part of the chamois loader before the framework is loaded. And so it will only complete if it is very confident that there, it is not being analyzed, debugged, or emulated. So I talked about this at Black Hat and Virus Bulletin last year in unpacking the packed unpacker. So if you're looking for IOCs and a detailed walkthrough of how to unpack these types of things. But basically what it comes down to is that this elf that made up stage three had in-place decryption, anti-reverse engineering, anti-emulation, which included 37 different system property checks, checking of the system architecture by reading different system files on it, as well as doing checks for the exposed framework or monkey. Um, and that's the only way they would continue. So they were willing to not operate and load their payloads if that they thought there was any chance that they were being analyzed. So the payloads that they ultimately loaded, on the left yeah, the left side. <laughs> On the left side of the screen, they had what we consider benign payloads. So one of the stories in the way that they tricked developers into including Chamois in their applications was saying, we provide you a mobile payment solution. So they have these different payloads that support these different types of payloads payments. And that was one of the ways that they were able to sort of grow a reputation or you know, have some credence to um, themselves as an organization. But those mobile payment solution payloads never actually operated that often. Generally, they supported all the malicious payloads, which were ad fraud and lots of different types of it, the app installs, traffic pumping, and sending premium SMS. So one of the most interesting parts and that I think really showcases the forethought and the deliberateness, if that's a word, of the actors behind Chamois is that when they decided to launch their premium SMS fraud payload, they understood the Android platform in that the Android platform will generally show this warning and notification if it believes you might be sending an SMS to a short code which will cause um, charges to your bill. So the Shamwa actors, 
decided that that's not okay and it might give them away. So what they did is they, if the phone was rooted, meaning it has just about every access, they were able to access and chose to access an internal permission um, that usually no one can access. What that permission does is it sets the um, property that makes it look like the user checked, remember my choice and send. So they sent that programmatically in the background before ever sending a premium SMS so the user wouldn't see these warnings. If it wasn't rooted, that was okay. They chose to use accessibility services to very quickly check the box and click send so fast that often the user wouldn't have seen it. So they were really thinking about how can we be most effective and not detected. But they didn't just deploy all these things, throw some spaghetti at the wall and hope it all stuck and monetized. They were very smart and very thoughtful in how they were testing before actually deploying. So one of the first things they do is that, as we've talked about before, most AV engines will only see stage one and before they, when they have to make their decision of, is this bad or not? And so um, the actors behind Chamois would iterate through all the different files that they include in the APK, all of the different factors, all of the strings, things like that, to see what are AVs catching us on. And we were able to watch them system systematically go through each of the different properties, even icons, names, different things like that, and they were monitoring to see who catches us with what changes. They also use staging and production servers um, so that they don't release everything, and just like any you know, more mature engineering operation, they use feature flags. So they will deploy to only they chose to deploy only certain features to certain populations. So sometimes this was based on your geographic location, what device you're running on, what carrier you were using. So it was a much more controlled flow, and if something didn't work, they could stop, cut it, remove it from the botnet before they got detected and caught. They also have a pretty big network infrastructure. So, when I'm talking about API C2 domains, those are those C2s that are associated with the Chamois framework. So how does it operate? How does it update? When does it choose which payloads it wants to use? And there are 10 plus different ones of those. For the module specific C2s, those are the payloads. So I mentioned there's tons of different payloads out there um, that we're currently tracking. And so far we've caught, or we've tracked 20 plus module specific C2 domains. And then for just their ad fraud activity in those payloads, they use 150 different domains. But I think what's more interesting about this is that they don't manually generate any of these. They work with large cloud providers, and they use automated cloud deployment to keep creating new ones, using um, depth, being able to rotate different ones, and it is an engineering operation. But one of the most interesting facts is, what happens if you're in China? So before they ever load a payload, do any checks, there's a lot of different places in the code. They try to see, am I in China? Am I operating in China? And if they see that, they immediately shut op operations down, no network connections, nothing. So just a little fun fact. But obviously, all this doesn't really matter if you can't distribute. If you can't get bots in your botnets, it's all kind of for nothing. So one of the biggest ways they were able to distribute was through pre-installed. Going after ODMs and ODMs, and we've talked a lot about the supply chain today, and this is one way in the Android ecosystem they did it. So they continued to convince OEMs and ODMs that hey, we have a feature, we have a sales tracker to support your analytics, especially on those um, lower profit margin devices. They said, we have a mobile payment solution that's going to support X, Y, and Z. We have an advertising SDK, or it's just a monetization SDK. And so they were able to convince each of these OEMs and ODMs to include this pre-install. They also distributed it as a static SDK, which means um, to developers, and so a lot of developers unknowingly did this, but it's bad, it's botnet. 
But one of the interesting things we hadn't seen at scale before and why the number of variants is kind of fuzzy is it seems they partnered with other malicious actors in the Android ecosystem um, to be distributed as well as, as plugins. And what that means is that other apps and other malicious SDKs would download chamois plugins and run it in the app context, and that was developed by other developers. They were also partnered with known harmful downloading families to get in those inventories of those harmful downloaders. So this is why it was tough to battle Chamois, because they distributed in a lot of different ways. But one of the scariest in going into the supply chain was something we've named Eager Fonts. So Eager Fonts is a fonts application that was included in one of the SOC platforms. And this SOC platform was convinced that, hey, I'm a third-party app developer. I've, I've developed this fonts app. And it's going to provide your users with so many more different options to see fonts clear in their each different languages. Turns out that third-party developer then included also an advertising SDK from, I guess, a fourth-party developer. That advertising SDK called out to remote servers and did dynamic code loading, or DCL, to download many different types of plugins and run them within the app context. So some of these plugins included Chamois, another family known as Snowfox, as well as others. And this is hard to track because it downloaded different things in each different instance. But because this had infiltrated the supply chain at the SOC platform level, it affected 250 different OEMs in our ecosystem across 1,000 different build fingerprints. So yeah, a big scale. But to the SOC platform's credit, as soon as we contacted them within that day, they did pull the app. They contacted every one of their OEM customers who had used variants of that platform, and they worked with us to create a plan to ensure this wouldn't happen again, such that they are no longer including any third-party code um, within the platform. So how do we fight it? We've talked a lot about why it was hard, why it was impactful, why it was sophisticated. So we teamed up on this multiple team investigation and sort of took a three-prong approach, starting with the OEM outreach in terms of the staunching and stemming the supply and distribution, ending with ad fraud defenses to try and prevent it from monetizing. And in the middle, we used Google Play Protect to try and prevent any new installs on users' devices, as well as block existing infections. So this is what the OEM outreach looked like, a lot of different steps, ma mandatory OTAs, <laughs> post-mortems, education, um, and thankfully, through the BTS program, all the OEM builds come through my team prior to launch, and so that was super helpful, too, because we were able to block them before they go out. And Google Play Protect, as you can imagine, signatures weren't quite sufficient. Um, that was one of the reasons we decided to create the investigation team. So we had to move to creating behavioral detections networks, code similarity, machine learning models, and do the more severe enforcements that we have at our disposal. Um, which immediately alerts users and say, hey, we blocked and disabled this application. Um, so why was it hard? Super sophisticated actor. Um, they have an industry presence. They have a reputation, a website. They have this legitimate project. Um, I put that in quotes, obviously. But they're able to show these benign payloads that they use. They also have very smart in deliberate engineering practices and release practices. They don't make a lot of mistakes, and they're not just looking for low-hanging fruit. They're, they're looking to be very system systematic. Um, they come up with sophisticated technical solutions. Stage three of the anti-analysis library was definitely one of the, is still the most sophisticated layering of anti-analysis and obfuscation techniques I have seen. Um, and they have a really mature infrastructure when it comes to C2, able to automatically deploy with their configurations on different loud, uh, large cloud providers. But they're stealthy. Um, they use asymmetrically encrypted network traffic. All their pay malicious payloads are dynamically downloaded. As soon as they do any unpacking of a stage, they immediately delete it. Um, so just very smart. But I think one of the most interesting anecdotes, at least for me, is how quickly 
they responded to each of our different enforcements. So I talked about how they would continue to iterate through each of the different factors of the stage one APK to see which AVs and things like that were detecting which different aspects. Um, but one of the things is, so last year at Black Hat, I presented on what I had named Wedding Cake as an anti-analysis library, which is their stage three. And at that time, I hadn't even claimed this is developed by chamois actors. But within 72 hours of me doing that presentation, before the video had been released or anything like that, they had begun modifying every single IOC I discussed in that presentation. So um, that was definitely interesting. <laughs> uh, also, in their stages of anti-analysis, they fingerprinted exactly some of Google's customizations to our analysis environment. So things we had come up with names for, the order with which we deploy certain settings and properties, and so they, they're smart. But I am very happy to say that we do consider Shamwa a controlled threat, and it's currently in maintenance and operation. And here are the numbers. So even when I um, submitted this abstract, I said 14 million. Turns out it actually, its peak was 20.35 million in March 2018. However, by March 2019, we have gotten it down to 1.81 million um, devices in the Android ecosystem with an active chamois application on it. And as of today, that's down to less than 1.6. But it's not like they had slowed down and made it easy on us to do that work. In that same time period, they deployed 12.8 thousand new chamois samples into the ecosystem. So as of now, there are 28.1 different chamois samples in the ecosystem. And each of those are different. Different rotations of each of the file names, each of the strings and signatures. But we have had a 91% decrease down from the 20.35 million in March 2018. So that's sort of why I will claim that Chamois is the biggest botnet you probably never heard of in the Android. <laughs> but we all know it didn't really happen if there's not hashes. So here's a bunch of samples that are up currently on virus total, covering a lot of the different variants I talked about here. And so with that, thank you.